All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, once again, uh, thanks for hopping onto our webinar. Five reasons you should update your ruggedized device strategy. Now in a Nexoned company, Propelix creates mobile strategies and world-class apps for the enterprise. Propelix is focused on producing internal enterprise mobile solutions for the Fortune 500. And uh, we work with clients across all industry verticals around the world, including Dubai airports, Bank of Montreal, and many more. And uh, Propelix has offices in San Jose, Boston, Pittsburgh, Guadalajara, and now in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. Propelix provides enterprise mobile strategy services in bite-sized engagements called Kickstarts. Each kickstart uh, typically takes just a few weeks, and I'll go through these uh, quickly here. Um, Propelix kickstarts help clients get up to speed with their uh, enterprise mobile roadmap, app scoping and prototype, mobile UI UX design, IT strategy for mobile, mobile center of excellence, testing strategy for mobile, and emerging technologies. We also provide soup to nuts app development, testing, and support, helping clients with app architecture and development, the management of their MCOE, mobile app testing, and mobile app tier two and three support. Um, under research, the Emerging Technology Council uh, is run by senior strategist Glenn Gruber. The ETC is a community of Fortune 1000 tech leaders eager to share their experiences and expertise. And now's a great time to join uh, the ETC during our open enrollment period. And you can learn more about um, the ETC at emergingtechnologycouncil.com. Uh, Device Squad is our own enterprise mobility podcast that covers all aspects of enterprise mobility. And it can be found in iTunes, Google Play Music, uh, SoundCloud, Spotify. Just search for Device Squad. Uh, and it also can be found uh, in our blog at propelix.com. Uh, lastly, Propelix offers three homegrown mobile products. Audit Here is the easiest way to audit anything in your enterprise. Exact Meeting is a mobile solution for finding and booking conference rooms and lead to capture. Uh, offers reliable enterprise grade lead capture and follow up for events. Here's a partial client list, uh, Propelix client list, and for client testimonials and more information on how we specifically help these some of these clients, uh, please check out the client section of our website. Uh, Eric Carlson uh, is one of our presenters today. He is a partner and co-founder of Propelix. Uh, Eric Carlson is a seasoned leader with a keen eye for emerging technologies. He's highly respected in technical and business circles for his ability to match technological geekiness with business know-how to achieve unique solutions. Having guided many startups through successful exits, Eric has the experience to advise clients on the discipline and objective approaches needed to turn ideas into reality. So today he is joined by Kevin Samberski of SOTI. Uh, Kevin Samberski is an account technology strategist with SOTI, and he has been an IT professional for 20 years, working with organizations to modernize and transform via solutions developed on strategic IT platforms, applications, and frameworks. Kevin is a member of the SOTI Advisory Board and works closely with SOTI's OEM partners, system integration partners, and mid-market and enterprise customers to elevate the status of IT to the business. Prior to SOTI, Kevin spent time at Microsoft and has a specialization in identity and access management using Active Directory and associated technologies, along with system management and monitoring solutions. Before I hand it over to Kevin to fill us in on SOTI, um, if you have any questions during this webinar, please feel free to enter them at any time in the chat section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, just do that whenever you have a question uh, and send it 
along to organizers and panelists to make sure I get them. Uh, we'll answer your questions at the end of the webinar. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining today. Uh, I'm Again, I'm Kevin Samberski here with SODI, and I did want to provide you with a little bit of information in terms of SODI as an organization. So uh, we are uh, a global organization with over 20 years of enterprise mobility management experience. Uh, so uh, we go back actually to the roots of uh, mobile operating systems with uh, Windows CE and Windows Mobile when they were truly the dominant mobile operating systems. Uh, we've naturally invested millions of dollars into R&D to support more modern uh, devices along with the operating systems. Uh, which include, of course, uh, iOS, Linux, and Android. Uh, we were actually the first in the market to have an enterprise mobility management solution on Android, and uh, we have a very strong solution offering for rationalizing mobility programs across operating systems and across, of course, devices, uh, which has naturally translated into a lot of success for SOTI. Uh, we have over 17,000 enterprise customers that trust SOTI's technologies. They've made significant investments for transforming and modernizing their mobility programs. Uh, we're broadly deployed in over 174 countries, and we have a very rich partner ecosystem of over, of over 2,000 managed service provider partners, system integration partners, technology partners, and over 150 OEM partners, such as Honeywell, Zebra, Samsung, just to name a few. So. Uh, did want to give you a little bit of background and insight in terms of who SOTI is. And, and as I mentioned, we are truly regarded as uh, the de facto standard when it comes to ruggedized device management and support across uh, endpoints. Uh, again, just a snapshot in terms of some of the organizations that have uh, made significant investments in terms of SOTI's technology. So a couple of them that I do like to highlight, and this is uh, very applicable within the ruggedized device space. Uh, United States Postal Service uh, have over 400,000 active devices under uh, SOTI's management solution, which is called Mobi Control. Uh, and we, you know, span and cross over many, many industry verticals and many customer segments. So whether you're a smaller organization, mid-market organization, or a large Fortune 100, Fortune 500, or Fortune 1000 type of company, uh, American Airlines, for example, uh, uh, we were able to really modernize and transform their organization and move from a uh, uh, a more legacy WinCE device model, uh, more to a, an Android-centric uh, focus. Uh, but we're also looking, of course, at rationalizing other endpoints, which include, of course, traditional smartphones, uh, various information worker devices and tablets, along with the 18,000 iPads that they've issued to their pilots. So uh, many organizations that I've stated that have, uh, have trusted some of these technologies of you know, our deep uh, capabilities, the lessons learned that we've brought forward over the 20 years that we've been in the industry, uh, and just our capabilities to deliver and align 100% uh, to the critical business and technical use cases, uh, ultimately looking to elevate the status of their IT organization to the business, uh, you know, getting away from the perception of IT as a cost center and more as a strategic business enabler. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so today's topic is five reasons to upgrade your ruggedized device strategy today. We'll be talking about how organizations are benefiting from rethinking their mobility strategy for ruggedized devices. We'll cover new applications, user interfaces, and customer facing experiences and discuss how they're making a big impact on company metrics. We'll talk about updating and effectively managing your mobile devices to increase productivity and time to market, as well as to greatly lower your total cost of ownership. And we'll talk about how SOTI is the industry leader in creating innovation, mobility, and IoT solutions for businesses of all sizes. And lastly, the final reason you should upgrade is because the revolution is already in progress and you want to maintain that competitive edge. So the first question today, what are we seeing in the field services industry today? And for the answer, I will now pass it over, hopefully, to Eric Carlson. Eric, take it away. What we're seeing, at least in this, in this area, uh, when it comes to field services uh, teams, so we've had um, this is an area that we've, we've performed a lot of um, both strategy work and application work over the last four or five years. Um, and we see kind of a couple of reoccurring themes that are coming forward. So um, many 
ter- teams that we've seen um, have a kind of an upcoming burden that's happening. And obviously one of the bigger ones if, for folks who understand this industry really well is that Windows Mobile 6 and 6.5 devices um, and really the OS will start to become end of life. Um, a lot of people are going through this now where they're having more challenge in finding older hardware um, or hardware that matches what they're currently using. Um, we've had large enterprise clients buying large batches of older devices off of eBay um, and things like that. And obviously there's going to be an end of life associated to Windows Mobile um, that's coming up. 6.0 looks like it'll be fixed. 6.5, we'll see um, if they extend that again, but it can't happen forever. Um, other one that we're seeing is that some older devices that are really on 2G network only um, that do not have 3G capability or beyond. And we're starting to see at and shut down 2G, I think last fall or something like that. Verizon has had a large announcement that they're doing it, I believe next year, because um, they want that bandwidth back to push beyond um, and to be able to um, um, carry less uh, carrier service. And so that's also having a little bit of an impact here where some it's forcing um, some organizations to make a decision on what they're doing. We we're trying to find a good stat related to um, what's really happening and how many people are still um, in this situation where they're using these older devices. As far as we could tell, it's around one in three that were still some sort of running some sort of version of Windows Mobile. It could be much higher than that. Uh, a lot of the use cases that we were trying to find and trying to do a little bit of research around um, showed that um, there was a good number of individuals or, or organizations that are still um, are still running it. And, and frankly, that's not very surprising. I mean, it's uh, these are kind of more keep the lights on type of use cases in many ide- in many areas. Um, a lot of times these applications are updated much slower than, say, other um, applications that might be within um, within the business. And, um, and and a lot of times it's one of those things that if it's not entirely broken, then we're not going to go fix it. And now it's coming to a point where uh, there it's going to be break, breaking really outside of a lot of our prospects and customers control. And what do we do about that? And some folks have found, you know, ways to be able to move past this in person thinking around um, instead of just trying to be able to quickly define and and um, uh, build a new strategy for for this area that they're doing a little area of list of replace. And so older uh, .NET applications, especially this Windows CE type things, use something called the .NET Compact Framework. And it's not really supported anymore, but there are methods to basically pick that code up and stick it within maybe like a Xamarin component where they can call on old business rules and and logic that's still written in that old application um, and still have to rewrite the UI, but you can kind of take that thing forward. And while that might be a quick kind of short-term solution, we think that and we've seen actually that the long-term costs are just much higher with that. Um, There's really becomes challenging to add functionality later. Um, it creates a very fragile kind of application architecture, uh, very difficult to troubleshoot what's going on. And it's really not necessarily um, solving the long-term problem um, that this is kind of generating. Um, but we're, uh, we obviously see a very large opportunity as well. Um, and even though this kind of end of life area is coming up for um, a large number of customers, um, and it, even though this is kind of a mandatory cost in this area, um, we think that there could be a massive opportunity as well. And, and really to take a slight step back and think a little bit more in terms of how things work today, you know, work today and, and how things have changed um, since the last time some of these applications have been architected or thought around. And so I'm going to walk through a few reasons, and, and I'm going to ask Kevin to walk through a couple of reasons as well. One of the first ones I want to talk about um, that where that, that opportunity comes from is just how organizations are thinking about um, this mobile strategy, if you will, for ruggedized devices. And so we thought that there is a, there's a couple things that have come together um, that have impacted the strategy. I, I, one thing that we, we definitely recognize is just the amount of, um, of work and of uh, maturity that's gone on the consumer side of the device and how that is overflowing into this area. There's just a tremendous number of consumer device advancements on Android and, other, and iOS and other ones, um, both in terms of process, in terms of the form factor of those devices and a lot of applications that are built from an enterprise perspective and even on the consumer side that has forced and created much more um, targeted and useful user interfaces. Um, the smaller screen, like from an enterprise perspective, there's no room to handle all these variations. There's, we really end up focusing on what's important um, and focusing on the scenarios that happen the most frequently. Um, and it's also created a lot of enterprise teams, frankly, and our customers and prospects that are that are thinking about this, that are building, you know, use cases for maybe a BYOD type of thing or something that they're using elsewhere within the organization. And so it's creating teams that are thinking about information architecture and user experience. And I think that has 
definitely been helpful um, when we start thinking about organized use cases. Um, and I also think that that really it's it's forced us to think about how we work and how we communicate um, and the form factor and other types of things. And like thinking about more about the user experiences is forced us to simplify process. And it takes us um, down the area of being able to take leverage of, of speed of development um, and those types of things. And and being able to use you know some of the device capabilities, which I'll talk around, like camera and other types of areas. And lastly, these devices just have far better connectivity than they've had in the past um, in terms of very fast speeds, um, much better coverage, those types of things. And and so we we also kind of see this this area um, that is really a, a you know a step towards the future of computing, obviously. Um, so we're obviously looking at that and and having use cases that it comes from an IoT perspective where you might have a field service rep with a device that's doing device to device communication with maybe owned hardware that might be at client sites and things like that. Um, and we're also starting to see it in terms of AR and wearables. Like obviously that is the, we think is one of the next major waves uh, around this area. And it's not appropriate for every use case in any sort of way, um, but there definitely are some use cases that are growing and we're starting to see a lot more, um, obviously hardware vendors coming out with that. And, and even behind all of that technology, there has to be business process and transformation there um, to allow much smaller displays and much more target information to be presented at the right time for action, et cetera. And so what we've seen and really what we think is, is kind of area around um, in this growth is really kind of thinking about this area of a maturity curve, if you will. And um, we've used this a lot for enterprise type of use cases and things like that. But if I think about um, use cases that are kind of in this area that around apps that improve or th things that we might be building for other um, individuals that could be um, CRM or ERP access to things or kind of simple little mobile apps and things like that. And what we're really seeing uh, both in field service and other areas is that we're looking at applications that kind of transform how we work. Um, in our experience, and we'll talk about a couple examples, but we've seen field service strategies that have created new business strategies within that, like how um, individuals in the field can do more, um, be a, a better face to our customer and be able to deliver more value to those customers. Um, a lot of core business information, uh, innovation, just how we work um, and even a, a, an older sale a service process that is based on older technology. And if we can do things um, from the types of device and connectivity, what else can we do with that? And like I said before, just like overall employee experiences um, and from a customer perspective as well as if we're, if people are handing a device for a customer to be able to sign um, on something that maybe is for service that's performed or other types of things, that might be the only uh, interaction that that field service individual has with that customer it might be, who knows, might be once every few months or 30 seconds a week or something else. And so what can we do during those interactions from a customer experience perspective um, to even do um, to move much forward in, in terms of value of that interaction? And so it, this idea is just um, in terms of what we do with enterprise mobile and also within this area is it's just a new way of thinking about things and, and a new way of, of kind of creating change within within process and within organizations. And so there's a lot that goes into the strategy. Um, and I talked a little bit around, you know, things such as um, employee and customer interactions, or we have more capable devices. And, and obviously we have things such as regulatory and other types of things. And it's also creating um, us as as implementers and as uh, individuals responsible for creating create experiences to think more around those business drivers. And there are things that we can do when we think about the field service interaction um, that we can really push forward. Um, and, and if it's related to safety or just customer satisfaction like they spoke about, or there are upsell opportunities, or can we differentiate um, based on what we're doing here within this tool set, um, we should take advantage of those. And lastly, we're gonna talk about a little bit later, and Kevin's gonna talk a little bit, is that these technology considerations have changed as well. It's a much different platform um, and management control and much more advanced tool set than maybe what these older applications were using back in the Windows mobile days. And so it's there's a mix of, um, of benefits there. There's also new challenges that kind of present themselves. And so starting with those business drivers, um, I just want to be able to you know share some examples. But these are this is a good example of a of a field service uh, customer that that um, we were starting to really think around how this interaction occurs. Um, it's more from a driver drop off pickup type structure. But what can we do from an application perspective and what was important from a business side that we can turn into functionality or turn into ways to change how uh, these representatives work out in the field? And so there's some examples here around growing market share through some customer acquisitions. So something that they never did in the past. Um, but are there ways for us to be able to develop 
applications or be able to bring functionality through their core workflow to be able to find that uh, opportunities to grow that market share. Enhance customer experience I talked about or much or, or at a core level, be able to deliver more actual information at the point of decision, um, which was a, a really, a really wide encompassing driver. But can we can we find things that we can deliver or be able to present information um, to that representative or that field service representative um, at the point of either customer decision or even at their own decision on what they're going to do going forward and give them the right information to go the right way. We take those drivers um, and we try to do a lot of process alignment and think about um, ideation and taking advantage of the devices and other types of things. And we try to build roadmaps of functionality. And I, this is something that we would recommend in any type of situation is to being able to take really what works today from a field service perspective, what has been challenging, what new business drivers have presented themselves um, since the last time um, this has occurred or being able to look fresh at it um, and be able to do a little, some ideation to think more around what we can do um, going forward. We think a lot around organizational readiness and um, how much change do we want to put into into place. There clearly is a, um, in our eyes, there is definitely a limit in terms of how much process change that, um, say, an application or uh, um, a specific business process can take at one time, both from training employees and as well as even the customer readiness for that change. Um, there's might be something that they always expect that's going to occur on this on this visit or, you know, how we how we service them or how we um, work with them. And, and so that readiness over time uh, needs to kind of be worked into as well. And we also look at just the ease of implementation and the cost and complexity of that and try to build a, a bit of a roadmap towards where it's going. And I think the, the last piece here related to kind of thinking more about the strategy is thinking not at a just an, an application level, but at a portfolio level. Redacted some stuff here to to protect our customers. But the idea is that um, when we're thinking about this process from, from, start to end, from start to end and thinking more about the use cases and these other business drivers and what else can we do in the field or what else can we do um, at the supporting organizations that support, say, a field service initiative, um, such as like maybe plan managers or kind of distribution places or dispatchers or other types of things. Um, what other types of um, applications or what other types of functionality really also goes after those use cases. And, and maybe in a lot of uh, examples today that we've had, um, there might be a, a Windows mobile device that's really wanting, running one application. And now we're thinking about a, a much more capable Android device that might be running five or six applications. Um, that it might be, some of those might be very rarely used, but there are things that we know that are gonna be um, powerful and will be presented information at the right time at that point of decision, for example. And so thinking about the portfolio that we think is a, is a very important piece out of this. At a, um, at a more tactical level, at a more application-based level, um, we definitely think that, that new applications and these UIs and customer-facing experiences are making a, you know, kind of a, a, a really large impact on those metrics. And so the devices are doing a lot more um, cameras and they're much more RAM and you know, with security from a perspective and speech to text and uh, better device management, things of, uh, like that, and more real-time geolocation, uh, multiple SIM cards, you know, much faster, much more capable of our code readers, um, Bluetooth interaction, all these different types of things. And so how do we take advantage of those um, in that roadmap and think about those device considerations in a way that helps us move some of this business process forward? And so really, can we take, can we also not just think about the process that we do things, but other capabilities that we can use that also bring forward within there? And so a lot of times, you know, we begin that process uh, with something we call a day in the life, or sometimes we can throw around the term enterprise experience map or something that we use to understand what maybe our, our either warehouse workers or our field service workers are doing today. And so we try to understand really how these individuals um, not just are using the application in place today, but how do they work around it? How do they bypass those things? How do they shortcut the current processes? Um, what are they performing for customers um, or maybe for internal employees or anybody else that is an additional type of service or benefit that's being performed outside the app? Like the, the my, my, our solution doesn't support it, but we're doing these things for, for from a customer service perspective. Many tools and hacks in the field, which there always are, but other things that we can use that maybe a, a single uh, uh, worker or group or a, a division or whatever else is using that we would kind of consider like almost like a process hack 
that we're saying, wow, this would be something that we could take advantage of at a more enterprise level. Um, and how do we, how do they measure good days and bad days? Like what, what separates those types of things? How do we provide information or, or measurement in the app or other types of things to have more of those good, good days? And ultimately what we've tried to do also, um, there's also kind of this difference between good service professionals and great service professionals. And, it, and people have different types of personalities and obviously, and, and how they kind of work the process and other types of things. And we looked a lot at those to say, why do some, some uh, maybe field service professionals have a much higher, um, let's say, um, uh, metric related to their service or much higher customer sat, or they have a much higher revenue per route or, or something else like that. And we look at those to say, what really separates that? Is that the individual? Is it those hacks? Is it some of the things that they're doing from a process perspective? And how do we take some of those types of things and institutionalize them in a way to lift up, you know, lift up all the boats, if you will. And so we look a lot at that. And and we've had customers um, that have really tried to think more along those lines. This is an example of a um, of a field service customer that um, had an application that worked much more um, around the how the database was structured around customers and route and contacts and other types of things, much more of a CRM type of basis, if you will, if you think about it that way. And we took a shot at trying to rework that UI, think about more from a route perspective. And, and how do I make sure that as I start my route and as I work my route, I can see how my metrics are changing over time, that I can be rerouted based on traffic issues, that I'm ready to go from a hazard or PPE perspective before I walk in, that I know what the customer is going to say before they get there. And once I walk into there, um, how do I make sure that I can quickly service, be able to collect payment or be able to collect signature um, and be able to present something to the customer that really shows the value that we're bringing. Um, And this takes advantage of all sorts of different contextual items um, within the hardware and other types of things to be able to make that faster, like speech to text and being able to have much faster barcodes, taking pictures of damaged product, things like that, which is which is a real big benefit of, of just really using the device more. Same thing from like a, a an integration perspective. This is a um, something that mounts to a um, a forklift that reads um, a forklift weight off of um, off of a forklift and allows them very easy to understand location within the within the location uh, within the um, distribution slash warehouse. Um, be able to scan uh, pallet information and then be able to quickly weigh and move things and tell exactly where they need to go, right? Um, but just being able to think away from just paper lists of where are these items going and what's the weight and, and is that weight matching what we're expecting um, to being much more um, uh, much more task driven and much more exception based where we can see when there's a problem. Um, same thing um, with another organization that that does drop off and pick up. Um, that's also thinking differently around overall sales goals. And so here they're presenting much more information back to that uh, driver slash representative to understand how they're doing from a daily or a weekly or a monthly perspective versus those because they are commission based off of that. And so that data, which might be only being produced at a monthly report, now is really kind of geared more from a daily perspective to see how we're doing on a day by day basis to move forward. And it doesn't necessarily need to be ruggedized as well. We, one of the real benefits here. Um, kind of moving towards Android is that now I have the ability to produce the same application on maybe on different types of Android devices, which is no big deal, right? Like I might have an application that's being used on a ruggedized device for full-time workers, but maybe I want to just have a couple, uh, be, you know, a couple consumer devices sitting aside for part-time, or maybe I want to be able to do it the BYOD perspective, or maybe I have a manager who wants to be able to have overall visibility to that that can watch the same information that um, maybe a driver is using and other types of things. Um, and even be able to produce this via iOS, which is another uh, op- opportunity as well, which is kind of being able to produce for multiple different platforms at one time. But again, these are just some benefits in trying to think forward around user experience, t- taking advantage of the device um, and thinking more around um, how we're managing our time throughout the day. But it's a real big, it's a real big area for, um, for organizations today to think um, how we can really go after some of those core metrics. So I know Kevin wanted to talk a little bit around um, the management, the manageability of these items. So Kevin, let me turn it back over to you. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Eric. And uh, 
Yeah, Eric was discussing a lot of important items in terms of the modernization and the transformation. And ultimately, what we need to look at doing, of course, is bringing this back in terms of lowering the total cost of ownership. How do we look at things like increasing productivity and ultimately effectively managing our mobility program uh, so that IT can perform all of the operational tasks, uh, roles, responsibilities. And uh, this is where SOTI really thrives in terms of being able to provide a comprehensive suite of tools um, our platform is equipped with APIs and just the extensibility, the overall integration, uh, but ultimately it really comes back to, um, so on this slide here, it's really what's relevant to the business here, and, and this is really often what it's, uh, is, is really what it comes down to. So uh, our ability to actually reduce the operational costs, increase productivity while we're securing the business is absolutely paramount to running a, uh, a dynamic and fully optimized mobility program. Uh, what SOTI delivers is the ability to get our devices up and running uh, and really quickly into the hands of our users and operators so that they can be highly productive, highly engaged, uh, and we are able to ultimately look at reducing the overall costs. Uh, we perform that in a number of different ways. Uh, as I mentioned off the top, SOTI is regarded as the de facto standard when it comes to ruggedized device management, uh, controls for the content, the applications, and ultimately the security on the device. Uh, and to bring that a step forward, uh, organizations like Zebra, uh, they trust SOTI to actually factory install our software on their devices. In addition, Panasonic does. Janum, Data Logic. So all of these large tier one OEM device manufacturers are uh, looking to SOTI, uh, trusting our tools, and really wanting that experience to shine through uh, so that we can get devices again very quickly and rapidly enrolled and ultimately into the hands, as I said, uh, of the users that will be using them. Uh, while we're doing that, of course, uh, you know, we're as a foundational and, and truly a fundamental aspect of what we do here at SOTI is uh, is security and whether that is managing, you know, certificates or authentication policies, um, doing device encryption, uh, out of contact policy so we can do some automation and orchestration when we've detected some sort of alert and then introduce, of course, some subsequent action on that device in a very automated fashion. We have a very rich security toolbox that we provide so that organizations can maintain compliance and the governance around their security posture. So whether it's HIPAA or FIPA or PCI, whatever that standard or compliance requirement is, uh, we provide that tool set uh, in order for organizations to, to maintain their compliance. Uh, when we're looking at supportability for our customers, for users, uh, operators that are in the field, uh, they could be within the four walls. Uh, regardless of what that device is, um, or really that operating system for that matter, uh, we looked at, the, you know, provide a, a an SLA, a service level agreement, where our users are going to have a, a high degree of uptime. Uh, we're able to actually give tools to these service desks and help desks so that they can have a virtualized experience to remote into any device and provide a level one, level two support uh, to triage and troubleshoot that anything that's going on. Uh, and just avoid kind of re returning devices back to a depot for any maintenance uh, um, and just being able to assist and support our workers that are in the field and, and our users of these types of devices. Eric mentioned uh, you know, during the um, previous slides around sort of that user experience and uh, that user adoption, which is, is vitally important when we're looking at a high level of engagement and ultimately looking at having highly productive employees. So uh, being able to customize that experience, whether we're providing a kiosk or a lock screen, uh, only surfacing applications, again, that those users and operators will need to actually interact with. Uh, having that experience uh, where it's highly customized, we've got various fonts and branding, uh, and we've all kind of walked into a retail store or some sort of environment where they've got a, a, a tablet or a device that's almost in a lockdown, really taking a purpose-built device and delivering a very purpose-driven experience for those users or customers. So really trying to look at optimizing the efficiency, driving up the productivity while we're driving down and reducing operational costs, uh, all while we're securing the business. So a little further to the rapid deployment and provisioning, as I mentioned, there's a number of OEMs that, uh, that trust SOTI by factory installing our software. Uh, there's um, tremendous advancements with the Android operating system and the fram frameworks that we're leveraging. Uh, so, for example, uh, a lot of OEMs are now starting to ship their devices on Oreo. This is a bit of a watershed moment in the industry where 
this is going to enable uh, zero touch enrollment. Uh, however, uh, there's a lot of OEMs still dipping their toes in the water on, on that particular operating system, and a lot of them are using previous uh, uh, Android operating systems. So we have a number of methods that we employ to actually provide uh, bulk enrollment methods of devices. Uh, we have the ability, of course, to provision a, an employee kind of self-service portal. Uh, so we can actually look to offload some of these uh, requirements directly to the user so that they can kind of auto-enroll their, their own devices. Uh, and ultimately, we have supporting uh, tools that allow us to either simply scan a barcode to provision a device. We can do things like an NFC bump. We take kind of a master device that has all of the configurations in place, just perform an NFC bump to the uh, uh, the secondary or tertiary or, or all those follow-on devices and really look at driving down the overall time it takes to actually enroll a device so we can deploy that out into the field and, and into the hands of our our users that will be using it. So uh, just clicking ahead here. As I mentioned before, the security is really foundational with everything that we do here at SOTI. So this is something that um, is vitally important to an organization for, for many reasons uh, and ultimately providing that uh, set of tools that will allow us to maintain any sort of compliance or, or regulatory uh, standard adherence. So uh, we do things like, of course, integrating on Android or antivirus, any malware engine. Uh, a lot of times, uh, I'd say 95% of the time, a purpose-built device is actually going to be put into a kiosk or a lock screen. Uh, this is a very effective way to manage the device. And as I stated earlier, really increase the overall user adoption and experience that they will have. Uh, this really allows us to prevent any unauthorized access to unsanctioned applications, perhaps from the Google Play Store uh, or any other application that may be sideloaded uh, or what have you. In addition to maintaining sort of the baseline standard of that device and the configurations by eliminating any tinkering or any changes to any of the device settings and so forth. Uh, so we do a lot with our HTML-based lock screen or kiosk mode, uh, but we also provide a lot of capabilities for things like location-based services where we can track devices. We can demarcate a boundary around a perimeter of a building, for example. Uh, it's a polygon-based geofence that we set up. And then we can provide some sort of uh, automated action when we detect when a device has either entered or leave that particular boundary. Uh, naturally, as we tie into various PKIs for managing certificates for uh, two-factor forms of authentication uh, and, and introducing single-factor forms of authentication with uh, you know, user-defined passwords uh, based upon IT uh, complexity and, and history requirements and so forth. Remote support is a huge area where SOTI allows for the rationalization of cost, really. And, and really what I mean by that is we drive down the mean time to resolution for support tickets. And it's very easy to understand what that cost really represents uh, uh, in terms of a, a device that isn't in the hands of a, a field services worker and the downtime associated, or the service desk, help desk technician that needs to uh, create that ticket and triage and troubleshoot it and really take it through to remediation and, re and resolution. So uh, by enabling uh, a lot of remote uh, centralized management capabilities using SOTI Mobi control, uh, we give those tools to those help desk technicians so that they can remote into those devices uh, they can execute uh, shell or script commands directly to the device. They can perform an on-the-fly app update if they have to, or even just look to maybe message something to that particular user and initiate a two-way chat session. So a lot of things have been you know, well thought out in terms of our interaction with our uh, users that are in the field and that remote support capability that SOTI provides. And, and truly the industry best in terms of remote control uh, and its ability to really span devices uh, and operating systems. So if you do even have a, a legacy footprint of Windows CE, Windows mobile devices, uh, that remote control experience will be very much the same as if you have a uh, Android-based device in your hand. So uh, again, that's a, a critical component to supporting the devices and, and our ability to provide uh, truly the best of breed remote, remote support capabilities. And we often take it a step further where we can actually look to record applications on the device. So there might be training videos or, uh, or various um, you know, screenshots that we would want to capture. Uh, and again, often HR will like to onboard employees and, and provide a, a better experience for 
uh, for those important training requirements. Uh, other areas, again, in terms of rationalizing sort of expenses and driving down overall costs are around monitoring uh, data. So there's a lot of capabilities, of course, for devices. Now, applications can certainly, um, you know, contribute to increased data usage. Uh, certainly unauthorized access by users streaming, maybe Netflix. Uh, we can absolutely restrict access to those applications and whitelist and blacklist them. But we also want to introduce policies uh, for monitoring any of the data on the device. So, and then again, introducing some sort of automated and orchestrated action when we detect perhaps that a certain threshold that has been reached. So we can put the device uh, in an automatic fashion uh, into a different mode that's going to drive a different set of behavior, pop a message open to the user that they've exceeded a soft threshold. Uh, if they do continue to uh, to use data and, and exceed maybe a harder threshold, then we could perform some sort of other action uh, uh, and just manage that uh, telecom uh, sort of expense and look to, of course, uh, uh, you know, just drive down the overall costs of, uh, of data usage. Okay. The next section here is around really migrating to a newer operating system. So there's a lot of impetus and, and a lot of reasons really that go into uh, deciding on what a, what operating system. And there's uh, amongst those reasons, I keep clicking on my left mouse button, I'll try to avoid that here, is around some of the security concerns. So certainly with Windows Mobile devices, uh, you know, SHA-1 certificates, uh, those are being phased out. Uh, the overarching theme here is ultimately that Windows embedded, Windows uh, CE devices uh, and operating systems are going to be phased out end of support from Microsoft, which introduces a, uh, a lot of risk and compliance and security concerns uh, uh, in addition to other integration. And ultimately, best practices naturally are to have a fully supported operating system that is any part of our overall IT uh, uh, strategy or, or infrastructure. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the inability to integrate into newer technologies uh, with legacy devices, as I mentioned, you know, that integration really can't be kind of overstated. So uh, as, you know, there's been tremendous advancements with Android and the ability to open up a, a, a wealth of applications, uh, uh, additional content repositories, uh, larger screens, more responsiveness. Uh, ultimately, it's the operating system that's really driving that overall experience and everything that is uh, is laid down on it from an application layer uh, really a presentation layer and just an overall better experience. So that integration is vitally important. Uh, employees obviously expect a better experience. They're uh, coming into the workforce these days uh, with a mobile device. Uh, they're kind of digital natives. They're, they're used to having a, an experience that's on a more modern operating system, a more modern browser. And they're really coming to expect IT to be able to provide them with those interfaces and those tools and access to those applications that they've really become accustomed to. So that overall experience is, is very important. Uh, but also a lack of development resource, resources. There's, uh, um, I've got a programming background, and when I was programming, it was on Visual Basic. I, I don't imagine there's a lot of Visual Basic programmers around these days. And the same really holds true with Windows CE and Windows Mobile. Uh, a lot of development has uh, resources, uh, and that skill set is being shifted more into the iOS, into the Android space, as this is very much a diminishing operating system. And to be able to tap into that new talent pool and, and even gain access to these development resources uh, that are, are very high priced uh, and are, are somewhat limited and they're in very high demand, obviously that pool of resources exists uh, uh, predominantly on the Android side and more and more every day it's, it's heading in that direction. Uh, the other side of it is around some of the HTML5 application and intranet sites and uh, everything being driven from that type of experience. Uh, uh, legacy OS browsers on, on Windows Mobile, Windows CE, uh, um, are simply not capable of, uh, of really handling that type of uh, traffic. So, uh, again, coming back to the overall experience on, on the devices. Android clearly is the direction, and we do see a lot of iOS as well. However, where SOTI really provides um, really a level of excellence on the Android stack is just our unique technology that we've developed, whether it's our HTML5 kiosk or lock screen, our ability to uh, do remote control seamlessly across uh, any flavor of Android, as well as any uh, you know OEM who has built their device on the Android uh, OS. Uh, so we bring a lot of our own intellectual property. Uh, plus, we've integrated broadly across each of the OEM-specific APIs and what they're 
you know, unique capabilities and differentiation is in, in the market. Uh, there's a framework, of course, called Android Enterprise, previously known as uh, Android for Work. Uh, so when we look at coupling in all three of these important areas within Android, uh, it really pro produces the Android Plus technology that Sody's developed, a very tight integration with, uh, uh, with the Google Android stack on the OS level. Uh, each of the APIs that the OEMs have developed on their specific devices, and then Sodi's unique and proprietary technology that we're delivering. Uh, and you can see some testimony here with Gartner and Frost and Sullivan in terms of uh, our, our unique capability for uh, tight controls and, and, and again, overwhelming uh, broad and deep support across the Android OS stack there. So, uh, so clearly we are the, the market leaders, but uh, it's certainly backed up by uh, uh, the industry analysts. Okay, so just shifting gears more in terms of why SODI is the industry leader in terms of mobility solutions and IoT solutions. Um, just wanted to discuss a little bit more around that for a moment here. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, Gartner has given us um, a huge accolade in our ability as a special purpose device support within their critical capabilities EMM suite. So as an enterprise mobility management organization here at, at SODI, uh, we are truly regarded, as I've stated, as that de facto standard in terms of device management, uh, the controls we, we put in place, uh, our ability to secure the device, manage the content, manage the overall uh, applications, and just provide all the necessary tools uh, for IT and for the business to maintain various compliance and security mandates. Uh, uh, as I mentioned off the top, Sody was the first EMM to have a solution on Android. So we were first to uh, recognize the direction that Android and the impact it was going to have in the market. Uh, presumably, this is why Gartner has given us a, a visionary as their, uh, within their magic quadrant for EMM suites. Uh, uh, this slide probably needs to be updated because we were recently awarded the editor's uh, choice for 2017 for the best MDM solution. So uh, we certainly have a lot of uh, industry analysts that are providing uh, kind of credence to what we've been doing again for, for 20 years within the industry here. So, and this is really what we do to accomplish that. So this is the philosophy here at SODI is what we call the SODI One platform. And uh, again, it really includes what we have here in terms of SODI Mobi Control, which is our enterprise mobility management suite. Um, it really manages business critical mobility and IoT device deployments. And again, the underlying iOS, Android, Linux, and even Linux and even printing devices. I talked about the rapid enrollment and staging out of the box, our Android Plus technology, our ability as an industry leader for support for rugged devices, but also on the business productivity for any email, app, or content management uh, included in that. Giving you the freedom of choice, regardless of which OEM, which OS platform you, des you decide on, and really offering that single pane of glass, that's uh, a little bit cliche, but a true unified endpoint management experience, uh, again, regardless of OS or device uh, that you have investments in today and where you are deciding to go into the future. And just to re-summarize again, the 150 plus OEMs that Sodi has a very tight integration across their device, our industry leading uh, Android device management solution, our ability to scale, as I mentioned, with over 400,000 endpoints under management with United States Postal Service, uh, and our just our unique capabilities for managing uh, rugged devices, uh, uh, the true standard within the EMM space for, for those uh, devices, in addition to smartphones and tablets as well, but uh, we are certainly regarded uh, within the rugged space. Uh. And the snapshot into the Mobi Control console. So this is the tool that we use in order to rationalize all the various devices and giving IT the ability to enroll devices and manage all of the fundamental security content, the applications, getting proactive alerts and notifications and doing a lot of automation and orchestration based upon rules that we set up and various triggers. So uh, again, it could be something related to battery life, could be a geofence uh, location event that we're capturing, uh, and just the broad set of data that we're capturing, we're able to do a lot of intelligent uh, actions based upon rules that we're setting up, uh, but again, also giving tools to service desk so we can clearly remote in and troubleshoot devices in the field as well. All right, just very quickly on the kiosk lockdown, so you can see an example on a Panasonic device. This is a, an experience that we provide, so you can see how customizable it is, and all in an effort to provide the highest degree of uh, user adoption and, and a, the very best user experience as well, all driven through an HTML5 uh, kiosk interface. 
These are other areas, of course, that we provide in terms of location tracking, as I mentioned, OS updates, silent app installation, uh, that rapid staging and enrollment, being able to sync files and manage uh, enterprise content, manage the browsing experience as well. We have uh, Android and iOS content management uh, applications in addition to our own proprietary browser that can be used for tapping into an intranet site while we're maybe whitelisting and blacklisting public-facing websites as well. It is truly a platform. Uh, we address all the various business and technical use cases and really look to tailor the overall uh, configurations to, to address those, uh, uh, those key requirements. Okay, and this is just a very quick graphic in terms of the mobility and the evolution as it relates to the progression within the industry. Uh, but underpinning it all is our, our deep and broad OS support. So whether it's Windows, Android, iOS, or Apple, or even Linux endpoints, uh, we're clearly able to manage any of the devices on those OSs across any of the various use cases or modes that uh, uh, those devices will be operating in. And this is definitely more future thinking, but this is definitely here today here at Sodi is our ability to manage Linux endpoints. So whether it's uh, an embedded system running a flavor of Linux, it could be a, a Raspberry Pi device for that matter, or an Ubuntu distribution of Linux. Uh, this is definitely as we're leading more into the IoT space and the revolution around that. Uh, the directionally, this is certainly where the industry is going as, uh, uh, you know, 70% of or 80% of IoT uh, devices are, are running uh, a flavor of Linux of sorts. So, uh, so with that, that's pretty well everything that I had in terms of giving you a little bit more of a, an introduction in terms of SODI. Uh, the last slide here uh, is just uh, the last one here, but um, ultimately we can manage your strategic mobility and IoT programs and uh, would welcome the opportunity to have further discussion. So with that, I'll just pass it back to our moderator today. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, the last one I just wanted to mention, this is Eric Ice. I just wanted to mention one more thing on, on reason number five in this idea that this revolution is in process in progress and, and maybe revolution is a bit um, on the nose but the I there's definitely um, we're working with a lot of firms that are thinking about this um, that are executing strategies along these lines um, that are using these tools and I think the the idea and the further um, of field service and the modernization of those processes and those apps is definitely happening um, there are there are different flavors of that, of course, and there's different levels of of transformation that's occurring. But there is a significant amount of work happening within the field. Um, my one last thing, just as a as a couple points, just to leave you with, um, and then I think Stephen might have a couple questions, or if folks need to leave at the top of the hour. But I, from my from my perspective and and, and Kevin's perspective, I think things that some short list of recommendations. One is definitely spend a little bit of time to revisit those field service business drivers and and what. Are those individuals performing that can be improved? How do those things relate back to the overall company's objectives and drivers? And are there ways for us to be able to impact those? Um, have a well-defined mobile strategy and try to create, like I mentioned before, about creating an actionable roadmap and a list of functionality and tie that back to those drivers to understand what's really valuable versus what is just a nice-to-have type of thing. Um, understand your target users and customers, like really true behaviors and needs. Um, being able to identify and look at the types of users that um, you have and those some of those kind of hacks and shortcuts I talked about before and really understand what those true behaviors are. And then also be able to get a good understanding of the maturity of the technology environment and kind of where those gaps are moving forward because the technology is quite different. And I would say don't just develop or just replace what's out there. Um, definitely look at proof of concepts or build some quick prototypes just away from, you know, in very quick tools um, and UI work and bring those out to the field on, on kind of uh, with fake data and with on, on just new devices and really try to understand whether or not we can really impact those drivers. And like Kevin talked about in terms of establishing the right management and infrastructure to support those types of areas, there's so much advancements in terms of reliability and scalability and the supportability of these solutions. And just the last piece is that with that solid foundation and start building up from here, there, there's a lot more ways to innovate faster um, and try to come up with some new digital experiences that really look at the customer experience and, and goes after some really large um, metrics related to efficiency and other types of drivers. So, Stephen, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Uh, great. Before we uh, get to a couple of questions, just want to mention that we're uh, running a special offer for webinar attendees today uh, for a uh, complimentary one-hour consultation with uh, Eric Carlson of Propellix and Kevin Samberski of SOTI to discuss uh, your 
field services challenges and solutions. All right, that said, thank you so much, Eric and Kevin, for uh, for uh, hosting this webinar today. And um, just the first question that we have, and whoever wants to take it can take it. Uh, when will Microsoft start phasing out support of Windows operating systems on mobile devices? And how might this impact us if we don't manage to switch in time? Yeah, yeah, it's Kevin here. So I I could probably jump in on that one. Um, so yeah, great question. So Microsoft, as we're well aware, is uh, phasing out support, which um, there's a, a few key dates that we do need to keep in mind. So with Win Windows Embedded CE version 6, that date is actually uh, passed. It's April 10th, 2018. Uh, for Windows Embedded 8.1 handheld, uh, the date is actually uh, June 9th, 2019. Uh, Windows Embedded handheld 6.5 is on January 13th, 2020. Um, and there's uh, Windows Embedded Compact version 7, if you have devices running on that OS, uh, will be coming up April 13th, 2021. And lastly, the Windows Embedded Compact 2013 is slated for support October 10th, 2023. So, uh, so there's sort of a staggered uh, end of uh, life, end of support uh, schedule from Microsoft. Uh, uh, why we would want to obviously be very mindful and start looking at developing solutions uh, around mig migrating to a more modern operating system. Um, well, clearly around, as I may have mentioned a little bit earlier in the discussion here, is around risk mitigation. Uh, so ensuring that uh, our organization isn't uh, susceptible to any security breaches, uh, any sort of uh, malicious activity that may be happening. Uh, clearly the device uh, OS is... Um, uh, would be opened up to potentially some sort of threats uh, as a result of it not being uh, you know, fully supported by Microsoft any longer. Uh, and this also has uh, sort of downstream repercussions. So uh, as I stated a little bit as well, I mean, there's a lot of integrations that were kind of locked in within that ecosystem of operating systems. Uh, you know, now that uh, Android and, and iOS even uh, to a certain degree, I mean, they, they really opened up the floodgates in terms of being able to adopt uh, more modern applications with better experiences and, you know, higher levels of engagement, which ultimately leads to, you know, increased top line, bottom line uh, kind of numbers and revenues and so forth. So just the ability for IT to interoperate, uh, the extensibility, uh, tighter integrations with various other platforms and frameworks, uh, applications and content management, um, it's, it's far superior and, uh, you know, vastly you know, better in terms of uh, an Android centric or as I mentioned, even a bit of an iOS there. Uh, and lastly, uh, obviously as an IT best practice, we do need to operate uh, with uh, with full support on all of our key infrastructure and uh, and endpoint management requirements there. So uh, so those are some, some, you know, three areas that we definitely want to be very aware of as uh, Microsoft is reaching and to support across all those uh, uh, operating systems there. Great, thank you, Kevin. Um, question two, uh, I keep hearing about contextual apps. Uh, could you just explain what these are exactly? Uh, this is Eric, I can take that one. So uh, I talked a little bit around that and just in terms of um, applications that um, take advantage of being able to understand the context of use. And so we've had, uh, that could be things such as um, simple areas such as location and so I might want to be able to present different information to maybe a driver if I know that they're working out you know if they bring the app up that's within a specific uh, warehouse or or dispatch facility or something else versus what's going up to a client site um, or it could be things that are more co complicated than that it could be orientation of the device it could be um, areas such as um, time of day uh, weather, other types of things that could also play the role of the contextual type of idea, but really having more sensory type information that's coming within there. Um, or it could even be, you know, even even being able to have alerts related to maybe a customer that's in jeopardy, for example, or somebody that we know has had uh, multiple different contacts um, with the organization over a period of time. And we want to be able to make sure that when somebody's going into that situation, that they have understanding of that. Some people call that contextual as well, but it's really just more of a business rule type of idea. Um, so I think I think going back to the idea of the, the device capabilities, there's there's definitely ways to take advantage of that, and, and I think the easiest one to start with is just geo, um, where I want to be able to you know you maybe saw a screenshot where we had driving directions and things like that, but there could be um, we've done things where 
um, as I pull up to a location and maybe a service driver needs to have a code for the gate, that that code automatically brings up um, on the lock screen or maybe it brings up on the application when it's when it's up. Um, and it just kind of does a quick overlay and say the gate code is 6521, um, just to make sure that they're not digging around for that or if it's a you know a different driver or something similar to that, or they're not you know remembering 8,000 codes to get into locations um, to be able to think you know more around the process of that day. Okay. So um, there's a lot of different descriptions of that, but I, I think the idea of, of being able to handle um, automated or other um, environmental factors and bring that into the into the business layer to say, what can we do here to um, to further the process here? Great. And one final question um, around one friction point, authentication. How has authentication improved with the new generation of devices, say, beyond four-digit pins? Um, I can start with that one, too, I guess. Um, so, I, you know, that there's four digit pins are still around um, and you know, a lot of organizations still use uh, route numbers or location dispatch numbers or something else um, as a kind of uh, a pin that's used on every device. Uh, I think there's opportunities there. Um, you know, obviously things such as facial recognition is a good one or, or not so much fingerprint in these devices because a lot of people wear gloves and things like that and, or have dirty hands, which we don't want to deal with. Um, trying to clean things off to get into a device, but but facial recognition is is definitely something that um, has some capabilities and and uh, the idea that I can have a device that um, if I look at it, it unlocks and presents that information or um, um, and regardless of you know what I'm wearing, if I have safety glasses on my face or a hat on or anything else is is pretty powerful um, and trying to get away from just a a simple four digit pin that can easily be picked up. Um, just by casually glancing um, and watching somebody. So um, I think it's a little bit early on the ruggedized device sense. I, I'm not sure if it's quite there yet um, from an Android perspective, but um, but there's there's other things as well. Like we've we've had areas where if there's if the device has been within Bluetooth communication of a specific type of thing, then it doesn't even lock. Um, for example, where if I know if I'm in a truck or if I'm within certain distance of that, then I don't even present a lock screen. Only when I get farther away from that, then we then we lock the device, um, things like that, where you're kind of thinking more about the, the contextual, I guess back to the contextual question, but um, some ways to be able to understand what the, um, the use of devices and in what point um, to be able to present that. Great, thank you so much. Um, that's all the time we have. Kevin Sambersky of Sodi, uh, Eric Carlson of Propellix, thank you guys both. Uh, and thank you everyone for hopping on today and have a great weekend.